going to uh, Dead Cow Gully. My pleasure. How was the trip up? Any dramas? No, lovely actually. Um, the road works between Caboolture and Kilcoy are pretty much done. But mm. yeah, no, lovely. Good roads are good now. Just um, just doing the final touches. Yeah. Do you that road works um, slowed you down like between Kilcoy and Woodford? Yeah. That was like that for a couple of years and it was always added probably at least 15 to 20 minutes onto mm. the trip. Yeah. No, it's, it's good. The roads are good now. Yeah. So, Cole, I met you last year at Dead Cal Gully. You were crewing for, for Jess. Jess Beninci as a part of the Run With Rob crew. Yep. And, um, yeah, I, I met you then and um, I stayed with you about a couple of months ago. Yeah. So thanks, thanks for the accommodation. That's Zach the right and I mate. stay there for the night. Door's still open. Thank you. Mm-hmm. What I'm really interested in, mate, is uh, your career in the, in the police force. Okay. I mean, your running's interesting, but I, I really f- I found out you've been serving since 87. 86? Uh, yeah, uh, 86, 87, yeah. Yep. Yeah, mate. So I'm, I'm really interested. I'm sure the listeners are interested in, in your life as a police officer and um, how it's changed over the years and, mm. and uh, you getting into the force back in, in the 80s compared to getting into the force now, all the differences. and Yeah, yeah. Um, ooh, okay. So where do we start? You know, little- well, h- how, did you, how did you get into the force? Uh, it was... What, it, it, I, I'm, I can't say that I'm one of these people that, you know, growing up, I thought, oh, no, I want to be a, a copper or anything like that. But my brother, older brother, Michael, joined in uh, – he's, I don't know, he's about three or four years older than me. He joined um, in the sort of early to mid-'80s. Uh, so he was already in. Um, I'd finished – uh, high school in 84, so I was just out in the workforce um, and he mentioned that um, there's a bit of a push on for recruiting at the time. I think uh, at the time they were sort of a bit of what we now call workforce planning for um, planning ahead for Expo 88 back in the day that was coming up, so they wanted um, some extra coppers to be um, on the beat for then. So um, I, I applied and got in fairly quickly, I would say. Um, probably oh, the whole process was less than six months, but, you know, I was probably a bit younger than I, in retrospect now, I was probably a bit younger than I, uh, would, than would have been ideal. I was still 19 when I when I joined. Uh, that was uh, when I started at, at the police academy anyway. So that was um, October 1986. Um, and then I, I got through the police academy, which was a, a pretty intense six months, it seemed at the time anyway, and um, um, sort of loved it and hated it, but, but got through it. Um, and, uh, yeah, got sworn in or graduated in May 1987. Yeah, so um, probably like most people, I thought I was pretty mature and growing up at 19, but, again, you know, uh, in retrospect, you, you realise that you're not and... Um, um, so I guess all of my formative, my, you know, adulting, my growing up has been as a, as a copper for the most part. Um, and, uh, yeah, did my first, my initial service was at Redcliffe. Um, I, uh, I'd actually already met Marie by then and we actually got engaged while I was at the police academy back in early 87. Um, and, uh, she, she's a, or was, is a, is or was a Redcliffe girl, I should say, at the time she was a Redcliffe girl and, um, sort of grew up there. So Cole, and and just for the, uh, listeners, we got Marie in the next room, in the lounge room, and so she's, she's listening intently. So, Mm -hmm. um, just, just be careful what you say about Marie. Oh, look, I, I don't think I could say anything that would surprise her, (laughs) uh, except if I was nice, that might surprise her a bit, but, um, yeah. Um, so anyway, look. Um, so can we just back up a bit? Sure. So, so how long was uh, training in the academy? How long was that back then? Uh, yeah, look, I think six months will let me, end of October, November, December. So it was, yeah, look, six months, a touch over six months. Yeah. Six yeah. months. Yeah. And then um, what was it like 
being sworn in like I, I guess there's a lot of excitement there's a bit of nervousness yeah is yeah. it like do you have a bit of a honeymoon period and then it becomes real or is it um, uh, is it just is it action from the start uh, from when you yeah look it's the um, uh, and I can say with a different I guess a, 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 through a different lens now that the 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 difference between the I guess the the theoretical learning you do at the academy um, compared to real policing, uh, it's a pretty steep learning curve. Um, the, as I recall, it was it was a pretty busy, tight kind of a pro, uh, program or a timetable at the academy. Um, there's always been um, scope for us to send like police trainees or recruits out to do station duty before they graduate but we didn't do that and i'm not sure of the reason and that happens from time to time uh just depending on other demands so if there's you know there's other things that have to be fit into the curriculum that in the past has been the first thing that they'd they'd dump um or, or you know not do so um but anyway um yeah it was a pretty steep learning curve um and, and i think in in retrospect I probably didn't have enough trust in what I, the training that I'd had. Mm. Um, um, possibly, yeah. It was a, it was a different service back then and a different culture. Uh, it was pre Fitzgerald, uh, and I'm not saying it was particularly, you know, there wasn't brown paper bags bouncing around the place or anything like that. But um, the yeah, I know. Just the the culture back then was, was a bit different, and as a young bloke, you kind of, you know, whether it was then or now. Um, I mean, not not that I was led down any great paths or anything like that, but um, you know, I, I did see people get a you know a bit of a clip across the year, and and um, when they've been a bit mouthy and that sort of stuff, mm. stuff that just doesn't really well it's probably more the exception rather than the rule these days so you're talking about the recruits so no, sorry this is when you get out it's worn in and as a, as a okay proper, gotcha. yeah yeah so, so during training back mm -hmm. in the 80s yeah you'd have your, your general general fitness stuff yeah you'd have uh weapons training yes you'd have policies and procedures yep what else what else do you learn yeah dri driver training yeah so, uh, that was excellent i really enjoyed that uh, they'd take you out to there was oh, I don't know if it, it still is there. Mount Cotton has a had the driver training circuit out there, and it had a big skid pan, and they taught you how to control slides and all sorts of things. Um, and uh, there used to be a uh, like a race track down in Surface Paradise, and they'd take you down there and teach you how to drive fast and right, um, you know, all those sorts of things, and, and really push cars to their limits. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's look that's something that's changed a great deal because of the technology in the cars these days you know they just don't um you know rear wheel slides or you know slides in general or you yeah. know it's almost a thing of the past because of all the, the you know anti-skid anti-lock and that sort of stuff on them dead cow gully is one of the most talked about events on the running calendar 6.7 k's each hour every hour until the last one is standing. We're located on a 1600 acre working cattle property and we've called this place home for about 150 years. We would love for you to come out and check out the action. But last year we sold all the tickets in about 14 hours so you need to get in quick to secure your spot. Tickets will go on sale this year at 6 p.m. September 25. Lock in this date, 6 p.m. September 25. You can register through our website, deadcowgully.com.au or on our Facebook or Instagram page. Thank you. With your class, how many people made it through the academy and, and were sworn in? What percentage would it be? Oh, uh, yeah, look, so we were, um, there was two squads of about 24 started at the same time together in, in October 
We were K squad and our sister squad was L squad. So I think, um, look, we probably of the of the starting twenty four, we or say starting forty eight, we probably dropped or well, lost about three or four along the way. That's just a fairly high percentage that actually get through. Yeah, yeah, and it, mm. well, it's and we still have a pretty good process, so. The people who start at the academy, for the most part, um, are there because they've got the um, not only the aptitude but the ability to, to get through the course. And mm-hmm. it's still, you know, um, if you lost ten percent, that'd be a pretty high, a high uh, attrition rate for a, for a squad. So by the time they get to the academy, um, you've generally got the right the people that are going to make it through. You know, but there's always. You know, people that get there for different reasons, um, they might struggle with a particular part, whether it be academic. We've recently had some guys who um, just had a lot of trouble getting through the driver driving driver training component. Um, uh, eventually, did, but but couldn't graduate with their with their intake. They were um, had their own sort of smaller in, a smaller graduation. A gotcha. couple of weeks later, yeah. So that that happens. Um, some people um, just isn't for them, or f- circumstances in their life change. So, uh, Cole, you you make it through the academy, mm. and then you're you're sworn in. Mm-hmm. Where was your first posting? Was that Redcliffe? That was Redcliffe. Yeah, Redcliffe. Yeah. So what's what's the biggest what's the biggest challenge for an officer who's just been sworn in? So you've you've gone through all the training. They try to equip you with um, you know what it's like to be an officer, but mm-hmm. what's what's the biggest thing that hits all officers in that first first year on the job? Uh, just the uh, the gradient of the learning curve, mate. It is very very steep. You know, we. Um, <clears throat> yeah, did you mind explaining I'm a, that? I'm yeah. Sorry, yeah, I work I work at the police academy now as a as a, a trainer or facilitator. Um, so I'm looking at it now from the other side of the lens, but it, it hasn't really changed. Um, there's only so much that you can you know, simulate or role play um, the, for a uh, you know a police recruit. Um, so they'll learn theory, and we'll try to try to give them context about you know how that will apply in a practical situation, and, and we try to um, you know run some role plays and things uh, a, a range of different ways. Um, but until you actually get out there with time pressures, uh, workload pressures, um, it, it just takes, like any new job, it takes time to adjust to the, the pace and the workload. What, 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 is, what did your typical day look like in Redcliffe? Like when you first started, what's, mm-hmm. what's the average day? Uh, well, look, one of the good things about policing is – Every day is really. I mean, there are some, there are, you know, jobs that you'll do again and again and again. But there's no knowing what's going to come up on a particular day or how many you're going to get. I mean, you could say, okay, Monday morning, back in those days where you had, um, you know, there was things like Saturday morning shopping was more common but you know saturday all day trading and late trading and that sort of stuff mm. was um fairly new so most businesses were closed at some stage over the weekend you know other than you know service station and stuff so it was not unusual to come in a monday morning and it'd be you're going out to take reports of break and enters mm-hmm. at businesses shops you know at um uh, it could be how people have come home from holidays and you know, the house has been broken into or you know, schools have come in and there's been graffiti or whatever. So um, that was, uh, you know, it's probably a bit different now because we're more of a 24-hour um, culture, environment, you know. Um, there's, there's very little time when businesses aren't open these days. So um, that's probably that's less of an issue. But, yeah, you'd go – you'd Back in those days, if someone rung and rung through and reported, um, you know, a, a crime, a police crew would go around and talk to them and take the take the details. Or if someone someone had come into the police station, you'd take a report there. Okay, mm. that's changed a lot now. 
Um, but if we're talking about 1987, yeah. Um, How's it changed? Would you say that um, what nowadays you, you're at the at their doorstep straight away? No. Or, no, no, no. Most stuff, um, things like that sort of stuff, um, mostly people will um, phone our police link, our, our call centre, and report it over the phone. Uh, and the reports will be generated out and sent to the, the state. So if police needed to attend, um, then it will be tasked to a crew to go there and, you know, do something like maybe door knocking or get our um, forensics, our crime scene guys to go out and check for fingerprints or take some photographs. Um, but in the past, the first point of call was a crew would go there. They'd do the initial investigations at the scene, make an assessment they'd arrange for you know, fingerprints, photographs and those sorts right, of things. Right. So um, we're, we've got a lot less of that um, for those sort of, uh, I don't like to call them routine job because they're very serious and important. Do people's cars getting stolen and their houses are getting broken into and those sorts of things. But the just the, the method of reporting is different. You, we've got online portals. People can go online and report things via online portals now. So... Um, there is a lot less of, you know, people calling a police station. I mean, again, back in 1987, you would have a either a sworn member or an unsworn member of staff on the phone every shift. So if someone rang a police station, it would be answered and details of jobs would be taken. We ran our own radio out of the – our own um, dispatch, I suppose you'd call it, out of the um, – the station so we'd then you know the old card system you'd write out a card you'd give it to the radio operator and they'd get on the radio to the cars and they'd, they'd transmit the job and, and um, um, task a crew to go to a particular job so um, so so <clears> now <throat> is it is it broken up into to more departments and units and it's all more specialized or um, well you still got your you know your your coal face police or your general duties police the ones you see um, you know, out in the cars, in the marked police cars, in uniform, etc. Um, just the way the jobs get to them is different now. Um, the, as I said, most jobs go in through Police Link. They can generate that job again online. It gets sent to the the nearest um, communication centre, which might be Brisbane. It up here it would be running out of probably Kingaroy um, on the sun, uh, like on the the coast, the Sunshine Coast or Gold Coast. Um, so just the, the major communication centre and um, as well as them generating it, or sorry, or uh, detailing it uh, over the radio, we've also got um, basically what we call them a Q-Light, but they're a, um, I, a, a mini iPad and they've got different applications on them and one of them is a, uh, an online tasking. So you can jump on to uh, ALCAD is the name of the system uh, and... Um, see what jobs are in your area, what the highest priority is, uh, detail yourself to that job and show yourself going without having to get on the radio and, and, and you know, that's obvious to everyone. They can see that that job's been taken by you know, your call sign. So, yeah. Yep. So it's changed a lot in as far as the way we do our business. Yeah. Yep. So first year on the job, mm-hmm. Cole, the, the academy tries <coughs> to, um, <coughs> excuse me, the academy tries to train you for, every possible situation. What's it like that first conflict situation where, you know, I guess you've got different degrees of conflict, but mm. the difference is is you, you'd have adrenaline mm. pumping through your body and how yeah. different do officers or anyone react when they've actually got adrenaline pumping through their body? Like how does that impact the decision-making process? Well, yeah, like, any human, it it, does, it impacts a lot of it impacts physiologically a lot, and uh, we probably know more about that or un- understand and teach more about that now than we did before. But um, back then, we were called a police force, not a police service, um, and there was, I guess, an underlying um, oh, I suppose ethos that you know. If you can do it the easy way, but if you don't want to do it the easy way, then you'll do it the hard way. Um, so there probably was, um, you know, use of force was probably a, 
I, I shouldn't just say that as boldly as that, but but you know, going hands on was probably um, reverted to a bit more quickly at times. You know, so um, and, and look, I'm not saying it doesn't happen now, and there's always a time when that's going to have to be the case. Um, but um, the communication that we teach police now, there, there are different methods and, and uh, types of communication. Um, there's a lot more work put into that than there was in the past. Um, I certainly didn't understand the, the concepts of communication, um, communicating with influence and that sort of stuff by any stretch back then. You know, it was, Sure. So, um, so in the 80s... I mean, police force, uh, <coughs> teaching, mm. it, it would have been the rough and tumble. So you, yeah. it would have been a different time and place and, mm. uh, you know, roughing people up would have been, I'm not sure, a common practice, but it would have been, obviously today it's a, it's a big no-no because you got some... Um, well, yeah, it's, look, there's a whole lot more scrutiny. Everyone's carrying a camera these mm. days. Um, and look, I think it's far better today. Don't get me wrong. I, I am so glad that young police new police so because they're not all young but new police don't have to go into that environment anymore um the um to talk about the old like the the it's a term that we still use at times but the atm principle so ask you i'll ask you i'll tell you then i'll make you you know so um that was you know a a fairly a a three-step process but it's it's um a lot different now um, and to be honest, with the um, back in those days, you know, we, we've got a thing called a you know a situational use of force model that they teach, hasn't, and they always have. Um, <clears throat> and um, you know, just by, for most people, just seeing a police officer in uniform um, is enough to if if the officer needs to ask them to do or get them to do something. Their presence alone is enough. And most people, um, if it's a reasonable thing and you know, people are more than happy to, you know, drive their car over there or stop, you know, at a particular place, you know, it's not a drama for them. Um, so presence is, you know, your most basic one, just by the mere fact that you are a police officer in, in uniform. Um, but we had pretty much... Um, you know, what they call open or closed hand tactics. So it's either, um, you know, holes and wrestles, punches, or, um, you know, using some physical skills that they've taught us, different different holds and things. Um, there was a baton that they gave us, a little, you know, rubber encased length of metal about maybe, I don't know, 18 inches long or so, um, and a pair of handcuffs and a firearm, you know, so... Um, these days we've got other options. We've got, you know, what people call, uh, you know, the capsicum spray. We call OC spray. Um, we've got tasers, which are just such a great tool. So in that you don't have to go hands-on with people as much, okay? Yeah. Because when you go hands-on with people, the, you know, ultimately they can get hurt and you can get hurt, Um and neither of those are good outcomes. Um, it's not a good outcome, you know, for the organisation, um, for the individuals. You know, there's it can be, you know, medical costs and work cover and all those sorts of things. So um, it's far better not to get into. You know, there are times when you've got to go hands on with people. Um, that's unavoidable, um, but. Um, the, I suppose, those extra accoutrements, those uh, new other tools that we've got, um, the the need to go toe to toe and punch on with people just doesn't. Ex- well, sorry, is not as common a thing to happen these days. Still happens because there's, you know, um, I think the particularly now one of the big changes. Um, you know, your big your big social problems as far as behaviour out there really was alcohol and things like drugs. Well, drugs like cannabis, to be honest, they they generally people who use that stuff generally are not 
causing you problems in so far as they're wanting to fight you. Not, and, not that aggressive. Yeah, they're, yeah. they're generally not as aggressive. Um, but when, you know, as amphetamines became more prevalent and all the derivatives of that that have come from, from then, you know, things, um, you know, really do ramp up people's behaviour. So, Cole, um, I wanted to talk about alcohol and mm-hmm. uh, amphetam- amphetamines a bit mm-hmm. further, but just back to the taser yeah. issue, um, how effective are tasers? Do people respond differently? Is it like um, uh, are they effective on most people? And in what situations um, would you use a taser compared to actually using your your weapon, your firearm. Oh, yep. Yeah. Okay. So look, it's all about the risk there is to yourself or to someone else from that individual. Um, if there is a um, a serious risk of injury to yourself or to someone else from this person, then you're justified to use your taser. Um, if the risk is uh, a lethal risk, as in a risk of death or extra, like what they call grievous bodily harm, extremely serious injury, um, that's when you consider your use of your firearm. So someone running at you with a knife, yes, that would be a, a firearm. That you, would definitely be a you, firearm, And yes. you, they call it, you want to neutralise the threat? Is that Stop what you, the threat. Stop yep. the threat, yeah. Yep. So what would a taser situation be um, like? What's an example where you'd use a taser? Yeah, all right. Um, uh, so we, we, there's a whole lot of different factors that you – need to and, and this is part of that um that learning curve with policing like you know it, it's it's hard to simulate a big angry person um in training because when you're dealing with it there's a real risk if someone's going to get hurt either the person pretending to be the big angry person or the person who's trying to stop them who's in training um so we can teach them some skills and um but when it happens for real, um, it's a whole different, like you say, the adrenaline's pumping and things. So, all right, um, back in the day, there used to be height and weight restrictions or, or, or sorry, standards that you needed to, to hit, okay? Um, and they've been, um, in, in time, that, that's been seen to be discriminatory um, towards, well, t- towards um, genders and particular um uh, races or, or nationalities and that sort of stuff. So, um, for example, many Asian people are not as tall or, or um, heavy as their equivalent, say, you know, white European Australian or whatever. Um, so, uh, if if you if you taser someone who's underweight, does that have a pretty dramatic effect? Does it uh, compared to someone who's no, no? So, so the point I'm trying to get at is that if I'm a smaller person, like I'm. I'm tallish, but I'm not a very heavy set. So, so if, as a police officer, if if I'm a smaller person and I've got a big, uh, roided up, angry fella coming at me who, you know, you don't know if they're drug affected other than judging by their behaviour, but very angry and coming at me um, with a fairly angry look in their eye and, and yelling all sorts of um, threats at me or my partner or someone else, um, then I would be justified in... Yeah, they're not holding a knife or anything like that, but if they get hold of me, I'm really probably going to struggle to um, defend myself. Uh, right. So yep. that would definitely be a, a taser, a justified taser uh, deployment there. So, so do, you assess, do you assess the risk on your own capability? So if you had an officer who was <coughs> six foot six mm-hmm. and 120 kg yep. um, compared to... Now the officer who's fifty five kg, like, is it yep. different situations for different officers, and in, in terms of them to using a taser, or is it? Uh, or I'll throw an example at you. Um, we had a phone call from Ryan Crawford before. Yeah, we both know who Ryan is. You you know Ryan, and I know who he is, <laughs> and I've seen him. Uh, I know a bit about it. But if you didn't know Ryan out in the street, and um, he's quite a tall fellow, but he's very lean. Um, he's not heavy set by any stretch, but he, he's very tall and lean. Um, if if I'm about the same height as Ryan and he's, again, coming at me angrily 
and I'm a, I'm a, a big fella. I'm thinking, oh, I've got this guy covered. I don't know that you know he's got a history in uh, Muay Thai fighting, and and you know he, I'm I'm pretty sure he could hold his hands up pretty well. Um, so um, <clears throat> even if you are equal size waiter, you don't know the capability of that other sure. person. Sure. So the the thing about the tasers are that they have had a bad rap, and there are times when um, taser deployments can can um, the the outcome of a taser deployment can go bad, but um, a proper deployment is very effective. It's called neuromuscular. Uh, what's it? NM neuromuscular. Anyway, basically, it's the um, electrical um, impulse going from basically one taser barb to the other. It actually um, it's very quite painful. Goes for five seconds, but it, it incapacitates you if, if you've got a proper deployment. Two two barbs, pretty well spread apart. Um, that person, while that five second cycle is going through, really can't do much except let, basically the muscles lock up on them. Yeah, and you okay? you drop to the ground normally. Yes, yes, yeah. You, you, um, if it's properly deployed yeah yeah and ideally when they drop to the ground you can you can go in like while that's while that five second cycle is going on if if you're my partner you can go in and grab the person handcuff them restrain while, them yeah there's no there's no ill effect on you that it's not like grabbing a, a live wire or anything like that um it's affecting yeah. the, the the subject but it's not affecting anyone who grabs them if you grab the wire that might be different or two wires i should say but yeah. What distance do you have to be away from someone for it to actually work properly? Most effectively, um, it's in that sort of two to four metre range, you know, is, is the most effective range. Yeah. And if, if they're moving, is it is it difficult for, for it to work <laughs> effectively if they're running or if they're... Uh, well... If they're standing still, I'd imagine it's <clears throat> relatively easy. Yeah. Oh, look, it's like anything, um, you know, using a... When you're trying to aim anything, if something's moving, it's always harder to hit what you're trying to what you're trying to hit so um yeah they're, they're definitely not a long distance uh type um option um it's more right that closer and, and to be fair now that the the effects of taser is pretty well known amongst the community or at least people have some idea about what they think it does to you um a lot of the time just a police officer presenting their taser is enough to de-escalate a situation okay so um, if someone has been tasered before or they uh, have some knowledge about someone who's been tasered before, generally they don't, won't go in for a second round if you know, they have that capacity to make that decision. Now, if they're affected by drugs or whatever or mental illness, you know, their mind's altered like that, they may not have the capacity to make that decision and, and you know, that yep. deployment may need to. So you see different clips on YouTube with tasers. You know, some people seem to go down straight away. Mm -hmm. Other people, it seems, um, can take multiple times before they actually go down on the ground. You can mm. restrain them. Is yep. so size doesn't matter. Uh, not is is a bigger person. Um, is it harder to bring them down, or is does it? No, not really. Look, it's, it's look. I, I've just got to say, I'm, I'm not uh, qualified. We have people who are qualified in training sure. for the taser, and, and I don't have that qualification, but I've obviously been trained in how, how to use one myself. Um, so th the fine grain detail, I, I probably can't drill down, but, but no, not really. It, it's, um, it's probably more to do with the, um, the effectiveness of the deployment. So... Um, if you can get a, a nice widespread of the barbs, then that uh, electrical impulse acts over a wider part of your. So if I, um, so if a taser was deployed to, you know, both of my pectoral muscles here, okay, then that would certainly cause a spasm upper body, but my lower body wouldn't be affected. So you wouldn't drop to the ground? Not necessarily. No. I mean, I probably would because I'm a silk because it hurts a lot. Yeah. But it wouldn't be uh, an involuntary 
um, I'd be dropping to the ground because it hurts a lot and I'd, you know, want to cry like cry for my mummy. But, um, but if, you know, you get one that's, say, chest to thigh or something like that, then that's going to lock up everything between there and there. Um, so, and that, uh, and look, people wear, you know, thick clothing at times. So if it doesn't penetrate, it doesn't have to penetrate through to the skin, mm. but um, if it uh, doesn't penetrate through enough layers of clothing, to, to, uh, that, that can be less effective. Okay, mm. so, you know, there's a whole lot of different things sure. that can make it less effective. Um, so, what's, so what's, the biggest, uh, what's the biggest health risk um, if a taser goes wrong? Can, can, someone's, uh, can someone's body just react really badly to a taser? Can it cause something like cardiac arrest? Or uh, it, in a, in a, it'd be obviously a fairly rare circumstance. That's, that's a, it's a controversial thing, and there are people who will tell you, yes, it's happened before, but... The what the training tells us, and again, I'm, I'm only speaking from what I've been taught. Um, the taser on its own, um, the effects of a taser on its own, um, shouldn't cause any sort of cardiac arrest and things like that. But um, the, um, the the cum- accumulation of circumstances, so a um, a person might be have, have a number of um, issues going on at the time. They could be in a fairly unhealthy state, so already have some underlying health issues, in, you know, he- uh, hard or otherwise. Um, they could be highly stimulated in terms of um, could be affected by uh, some sort of illicit substances. They could be, you know, if they're involved in some sort of a, a criminal activity, have been running or been agitated or been hyped up or, you know, road rage or whatever. So they've got all of that going on inside them as well. Um, <clears throat> they, um, you put a taser on top of that and then as it, it goes for five seconds then you get some police on top trying to wrestle them and handcuff them. Um, all of those factors together can tip them over the edge yep, in sure. terms of the heart goes sure. bang I can't take sure. this anymore um, so generally so look I can't say with any authority no it'll never cause a heart attack on its own um, but but they train us about all those those sure. things excited delirium and those yep. sorts of things uh, yeah and, and, and you wouldn't you obviously don't have any knowledge if someone's got an underlying heart condition or health condition you just no. have to there's the threat you've got to take them as they yeah. are and yeah. you've yep mm. So, um, okay, so, so tasers came in, what, mm. 10, 15 years ago, 10 years ago? Yeah, I think it was just a little over 10 years ago, but, yeah, around about, yeah. Over 10. Yeah, yeah. And in the academy um, today, every officer would get tasered? Sorry, uh, more than 10, it's just more than 10 years ago, but um, no, no. Oh, so you don't have to? No. Oh, I thought officers uh, taser each other. There, there was a time. There was a time when we um, gave recruits the option to have a, a voluntary exposure, we called it. Um, and, you know, it was – look, I'm sure uh, when I was going through, if I had the option, I would have taken it because it's that male ego thing. Um, but um, at the moment, that's that's been taken out of the, uh, the curriculum. I don't know the – I don't because I don't train in that area, so I don't know what the um, the reasons or politics are for that. Um, it wouldn't be to do with injury rates because really we rarely, if any, well, we we rarely had any injuries as a result of taser expo- uh, exposures. Um, the ones that I've seen done. Um, with recruits, they're already lying on the ground. So the other thing you were talking about, people getting injured, you know, if you're standing up and you get tasered and suddenly you can't and you fall down, well, there's always a risk you can knock your head. Sure, that, you can hit, hit your skull. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, but anyway, so they they um, they still have an exposure to um, the OC spray, the capsicum spray, mm. um, because. Um, even when you deploy capsicum spray, 
it can blow back at you when you're going in to try and deal with that person you've because you've got to give them aftercare you can't just spray them and go ha ha you just have to sit there you've got to go and give them relief because it's painful it is very painful um you need to understand that when you get what we call a secondary exposure you can still function you know you your eyes are going to be watering and stinging but you can still function you know and you need to know that rather than the first time you learn it is in a critical situation out on the road Mm. um so um that still happens um the taser exposure at the moment doesn't happen sure could change i don't know these things change all the time so you, you've been tasered before no i haven't oh you uh, have I, I didn't get trained or um i didn't get my training in taser uh until actually after i'd got off the road so i did 20 years on a road as operational police officer yep. Um, OC spray come in while I was on, uh, still on the road, um, so I got trained in that and exposures and things. But um, then I got into training and I hadn't um, – tasers came in about the same time as I was getting into off, – off, out of operational police and into training. Um, so um, I jumped in with a recruit group and, and – um, um, got my qualification done then and at the time i did it actually i i was doing a fair bit of riding and mountain biking i had a big i had a big buster off my mountain bike the weekend before um i had a massive big edema on my hip and i i said look i'm happy to do it but i've got this and this and this and they said yeah no we're not going to let you do it this time so i probably dodged a bullet there so to speak a hypothetical one or a um, metaphorical one i suppose yeah but um (laughs) um so but yeah to, um so no i haven't is, is the, the yes yeah, so, i mean what what is the pain like is it because i know i've <clears throat> obviously a lot of people have touched like an electric fence and mm. it's just like a bit of a jolt yeah it's obviously a lot lot greater than that <clears throat> by magnitude of probably what yep. five or ten who knows but i wonder what 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 would the pain be like on a scale of one to ten uh, is it is it very unpleasant I believe so. The, the um, as it's been described to me, that the big difference. So, um, I don't know if you've cut up chilies or something in your kitchen and you've rubbed your eyes and you've got that, you know, that stinging pain in your eyes. Well, that's kind of like capsicum spray, but times you know whatever. It's supposed to be like a hundred times. Sure. Um, more severe than that um so um it's it's painful and the pain continues until and it can continue for a long time um the the only when i was getting trained in it the only way i ever got relief from it was to put my head in a bucket of water and open my eyes and the pain stops immediately but obviously there's a breathing issue so as soon as you take your head out the pain comes back again so it's a matter of washing that uh, out of your eyes over time so but with taser um you're incapacitated you've got you've got extreme pain um <clears throat> you are an effective deployment you can't you, let's say you can't move but you've really got to some people have got to, the, we do like tests where they'll be on the ground taser exposure put a knife down in front of them can you crawl forward and get the knife or some people can crawl forward a bit with with difficulty um no one just shrugs it off and and you know whatever but other people are just you know screaming too high too sure. much pain um but as soon as that five second ends it's over you get back to you're, it you're normal other yeah, than yeah. the awareness that you've it's just hurt a lot you're, yeah. you're normal again yeah wow you can see and hear everything that's going on around you yeah um everyone says it's it's longer than five seconds, but it's yeah, it's, yeah. it's five, the five second ride they call it. Yeah. So, mate, he, here's a big one for you. Mm-hmm. So, PTSD. Yes. Um, I'm not sure how much they talked about that when you went through the academy back in the mm-hmm. '80s. Did it even exist? Maybe it was just maybe it was just a few scientific papers on it. I'm not sure, but um, obviously it's a it's a big thing now. Mm-hmm. So, how how can you how can the police force possibly prepare people for, for for something like PTSD. So, I mean, first responders in general. So you yep. could talk about, um, 
police officers you could talk about. Um, I've got some cousins who respond to um, motor vehicle accidents mm -hmm. who are the first ones on the scene and yep. they're obviously going to be exposed to something. So you know it's coming. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how can you possibly prepare officers for that and, and what, can, what can the police do as an organisation if they know it's coming? Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, I, I I can talk about this with a bit of authority actually, because I've I don't know if, if you could say I have it or I had it. Um, I don't know that you ever cured of it. I've, I've, I was diagnosed with PTSD back um, in two oh, well, about two thousand and seven. Um, in my view, you, you never cured of it. You just learn how to manage it better and manage yourself better is probably the more the better term. Um, how it was dealt with, you know, back in 1987 compared with 2023 um, is like, um, I suppose, comparing a Model T Ford with a, a Tesla. You know, we are so much better understand it so much more it's uh understood and acknowledged by society by the organization um I, my view and this is only my view um any um proactive um keen police officer um if they stay operational for 10 years they will um, have elements of PTSD. They will yeah. experience it. I mean, how, how can how can you possibly avoid it? I mean, it it, it just I can understand <clears throat> if you're if you're in the office maybe, but if if you're on if you're on patrol, I mean, yep. how you know it's coming? Mm -hmm. How how do you prepare yourself for it? Okay, so all right, well, post traumatic stress disorder. Okay, can you avoid traumatic stress as a police officer? Well, no, you, as an operational police officer, no, you can't. Okay, if you, you know, if you spend, you know, if you do your 12 months training on the road and then you go and find yourself um, a office job somewhere, that doesn't really happen that often, but, um, you know, I, I spent 20 years on the road Um some people spend more time than that. Many people spend less time than that. Um, so um, you, you can't avoid avoid traumatic stress in that job in in the pl in policing. Um, but how you manage yourself and deal with it, it determines whether you end up suffering from post traumatic stress disorder. Right. Um, if that answers the question. So um, what what does the police do? What what's the policy? An officer goes through a traumatic event. Um, I guess it's important what you do after that traumatic event. There must be a process involved. Like how do you how do you deal with someone who's and I guess there's different levels of trauma. Sure. It could be it could be a scuffle. Mm -hmm. It could be a scuffle Friday night, Fortitude Valley, um, right up to deploying a weapon or yeah. something mm -hmm. something more more traumatic so how uh, how do you deal with it um well in my case not very well um i just kept turning up and doing my job um how the organization deals with it, uh, deals with it now now i've i've got no horror stories to tell about the uh support and assistance i got from the qps when i got sick um but since that time, um, the the organisation has just come ahead in leaps and bounds. So um, we pretty much start preparing recruits from day one. You know, it's talked about, it's acknowledged. Um, we have um, professional, like we have psychologists embedded within the organisation whose job is to support police with those things we have a number of different ways and platforms where you can get help you can go online you can do a 
even a self referral now to get um, you know I've I've you know completed online portals and availed myself of uh, interviews or sorry um, um, course of treatment from a, a psychiatrist okay mm-hmm. all um, paid for by the well, no, the, not by me anyway, the government or the QPS or whatever. Um, so all of those things are in place. Um, we talk to the recruits a number of times. We have our our um, um, you know our, our senior psychologists come and talk to them almost well in week one and come back and talk to them again as they go along. Um, <clears throat> you know, it, it's acknowledged all the way through the organisation. It is um, still up to the individual. You know, I did the typical thing i just kept turning up to do the next job do the next job yeah um there was there was certainly signs there marie knew it um um but it really had to be me that did something about it sure um and you know certainly yeah i I wouldn't i would hope you know people can uh and there's still there is still a I'm not saying that we've you know we've cured this problem but we are dealing with it better that there's still a perception within the organisation or from organ uh, from individuals within the organisation um, that it is you know a black mark against you or us you know seen as weakness to mm-hmm. you know seek help or to acknowledge that you're not doing so well okay but um, that's yeah. A, a, with every you know day and year um we just get better and better at that the police union uh have put initiatives ongoing initiatives in place to support mm. the staff um there's all sorts of um you know there was a thing i was looking at the other day which is the um the blue hope coffee van they just it's off-duty police or, or other volunteers who just take a coffee van around any time day anywhere just open up the door the coppers can come and grab a free coffee and a a burger and um, have a chat and um, they've also uh, got funding to you know for some extra other psychologists if people want to go down that way to get help Um, we have sorry um, we've got you know a health and well-being safety health and well-being section and um <clears throat> the um uh there are people in here who can give you advice about uh diet lifestyle all, all these lifestyle factors diet exercise um there's a uh, fitness passport that they arrange where you can um i think for whatever i don't know what the fee is because i don't i don't use it but uh, for whatever the fee is you can Wherever you are in Queensland, there's all these different gyms that you can get membership to. So if you're if you get posted to Mount Isa, um, you don't have to join the gym up there. You've got this fitness passport that says you can go to the gym there. You know? Gotcha. So um, there's a whole lot of things like that. On June 17 at Dead Cow Gully, we are hosting the Australia Backyard Masters. This event will be simply epic. We have signed up the best backyard runners in this country. Plus, we have the ultra running legend, Harvey Lewis, flying over from the US. We also have the NZ7, which is a team of elite Kiwi runners who want to take on the Aussies. This will be a showdown for the ages, but we need your help. Most of the interstate and overseas runners don't have crew or any equipment. They're literally jumping on the plane and turning up to the event. So if you can help us out with some equipment like a marquee or a chair, or if you could volunteer as crew, we would love to hear from you. Can you please get in contact? If you can help out, just send me a message on 0439 666 079. We would really love your help and they would be forever grateful. Thank you. So, Cole, um, so an officer goes to a traumatic event, mm-hmm. and as we said, there's different degrees of trauma. Mm-hmm. Uh, what if they say, oh, mate, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm totally fine. Yep. There's, there, there's nothing wrong. Yep. And, well, one, one, they could just be saying that. But two, um, 
maybe they are fine and they don't yep. actually realise it doesn't actually pop up yep. till later down the track or it's something which grows over time. What do you do in those situations? Is there um, compulsory uh, therapy or is there compulsory things you have to do if you've identified that someone has gone through trauma? Mm-hmm. Um, then I guess if you gave a lot of people the option, they could just say, oh, she's right, mate, you know, mm-hmm. I'm a cop, this is what's to what be expected. Yeah. Um, how, do you, how do you track... Do you, do you track these people over time or do you um, – what's the process there? Uh, well, look, to, to be th- – there's no strict uh, – I mean, if there's like a uh, – we'll talk about the, the you know, the, the incident out at Tara last year where the two young officers were killed uh, and you know, other officers involved out there. So um, the – um, the other officers, the survivors, um, you know, they, they need to be interviewed by our you know, ethical standards. You know, when there's a, a police involved death or, or shooting, or uh, then you know, there needs to be investigations to make sure that everything was there was nothing untoward about it. Um, but um, as an organisation, we understand that you know this has been a very traumatic incident for these people. There is an acknowledgement that they need to be supported um, before and during and after that happens. Um, there is um, uh, specific leave that they are not only entitled to, they're made to take. I think it's three days. They must take three days off. Uh, and be checked in on uh, over those times. Uh, so that's at the high end of it. Um, but this, what we're talking about for policing, it's it's a, um, at its basis level, I mean, it, it's, it's a, a workplace health and safety issue and it's everyone's responsibility to, to do something about that or to monitor that. So... Um, for the most part, we tend to look look out or look after and look out for each other. Mm. And sometimes we do it well and sometimes we don't do it so well. Um, so back in the old days, yeah. I guess a lot of problems would have been solved by, have you know, ha- having some beers, going yep. out. If you've had a something happen, let's just go yep. to the pub and let's just have a big night. Absolutely. And I guess yeah. um, the police traditionally have been known to be, you know, um, big drinkers that's the stereotype yep. Yep. but that was probably just dealing with trauma and having and dealing with yep Self, stress and self-medicating self-medicating i guess yeah. that's yeah i guess it's probably still a thing today <laughs> oh look i'm i'm sure it, it it does happen um and i've probably done it myself at times um but uh, I, I think again as an organization um we are better at that to be honest uh, um <clears throat> i i get it there's not the the drinking culture that there used to be in the qps which is you know is a good thing and i'm not i love i love a beer um and um i love a red wine and i love a rum um but and i've drunk i've drunk to excess in my time but less and less now um I just enjoy it for a like on a on a hot day after you mow the lawn, have a beer. It's just a, a nice feeling. Yeah. But um, but I think there's to be honest, we're getting more of a coffee culture than a than a drinking yeah. culture. Uh, I'm not saying <laughs> well, you know, young people are still young people, whether they're coppers or not. They still go out clubbing. Um, well, we young people in general are mm-hmm. drinking less. Yeah. So new recruits, they would be in that same demographic. <laughs> yeah, for they? sure, for sure. Compared yep. to the eighties, right? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah. Look, and again, I, I you know, I, I can't speak with any knowledge on you know, young people and what they do because I'm not one of them anymore. Um, and uh, even even our kids are now sort of late twenties, early thirties. So. Um, but yeah, for sure, you know the the recruits coming in now. I, I certainly see them um, uh, more. Well, I tend to look at them more from um, a 
parenting perspective in terms of, yes, these are young people who are going into a tough job and mm. I want them to be ready for it. You want them to succeed. Mm. Um, you want them to do well. Um, <clears throat> and you try and support them to do that. But, um, you know, I, I know that they, they go out and have a few sure. a few drinks and a bit of fun. But um, they're also very conscious that, particularly while they're at, uh, as a police recruit, that if they go out and do something stupid and get, become the attention of the police, um, it's going to be a very career-limiting move for them, you know. Mm. And they've had to work hard to get there. You know, it's, it's a hard process to get through, to, to get to the police academy. And if that's what your dream is, then, you, you know, you, you're putting a lot on the line to just do something for one silly night out. So, so uh, Cole, just to close the chapter on PSD, um, yeah. I guess if I was a recruit hmm. sitting in the, you know, in the academy, um, You'd probably be pretty good too, I reckon. Too. Well, thanks, if mate. You're, you're having, if you give it a bit of thought, we're looking for looking for people, mate. <laughs> I guess well, to me, it, it's, it's sort of the elephant in the room. It's the, hmm. the, the PTSD because yeah. if you're thinking I'm, I'm going into a career where I could put myself in harm's way, mm-hmm. and you've got that ripple effect. Because if, if you're affected by PTSD, what about your family and friends? And the yep. ripple just keeps it sending yep. outwards. So, and as you said, it's it's what what you're saying is it's it's almost impossible to avoid if if you're if if you're in the if you're on the beat for for ten years if you're oh, I am. I, but I guess what you're saying is how they deal with PTSD has changed dramatically. Well, the traumatic stress part of it, yes. The, to get the disorder, it, it means that um, – sorry, I, this is – put that on. So the traumatic stress is unavoidable. Can't avoid um, that. No, it's yeah. part of what you see, what you do. You know, like um, child death was the things that, that ended ended my career in, in you know, child protection mm. investigation. So um, – the so you, it's part of your job. You've got to go, um, so you can't avoid it. But how you manage yourself, who you talk to, you know, I didn't really talk about. I didn't bring that stuff home. I didn't talk to Marie. Definitely didn't talk to the girls about it. Mm. Um, I didn't really talk to people at work about it. You just get on with the job. Um, um, and so for you, was it just a build up over time? Was, yeah, an accumulation. A number of incidents and pretty much, yeah, yeah. And um, I guess what, what are the symptoms of PTSD? Uh, look, I, I knew, look, I knew something was coming. Um, I was, um, you know, I was feeling overwhelmed by the, the amount of work that I had to do. Uh, I had in fact spoken to my boss about the number of child deaths I'd attended over the past sort of mm. 12 months. Mm. Um, every time there was one, it, I seemed to be working. And um, <clears throat> and then the boss uh, – sorry, uh, I, I was working a particular – the boss said, look, we'll, we'll try to, you know, keep you off those for a, for a bit until you can get, get on top of stuff. Um, and then I was working on, you know, like a, a night shift and um, a job came up and – I was working and it was, you just, you, you know, I'm not the sort of bloke that's going to say, look, oh, well, I'm, I'm not doing it because it's sure. too much for me emotionally or whatever. I just get on and do it. Um, the, um, but, you know, not sleeping well. Um, for me, just going into my shell, um, you, probably Marie would be better one to talk yep. to about what the symptoms were. I know the... When it came to a head, basically, I got up one morning and I just um, couldn't bring myself to go to work. I just sat yep. on the floor at the end of the bed and just started crying uncontrollably. Yep. So, yep. So, yep. so yeah. those physical sensations, yeah. can't go to work. Yeah. Yep. Um, yep. That that was the – when it came to a head. But, mm. um, you know, I, I really – and to a degree now, I probably still – I've got better at – the um, um, what's the the treatment? The um, mate, memory loss is one of them. I, mate, I, I struggle to remember stuff that that's happened. Memory, I say, oh, this, this, and this happened. Going, 
I, I just don't remember it, you know. So I, you know, some things get compartmentalised away. Mm. Um, yeah, so you could feel this coming on. Yeah. You could feel it's sort of a build-up, build-up, and then and you find <clears throat> yourself in that situation, yeah. can't go to work. Yeah. Um, what do you what do you do then? Obviously, you've got to take time off work. Yeah, I, I did. I had quite a bit of time off work. So, um, you know, and this is where if I didn't have, you know, the, the family that I have to support mm. me and um, didn't have the support of the organisation. And look, I've, I've spoken to people who have had horror stories, you know, mm. in terms of the way they, they were treated or they, their story about how – they were treated by mm-hmm. within the, the organisation or the system or an individual. Um, I haven't got one of those. I, I was really well supported by, by my bosses. Um, I think it actually took everyone by surprise because I was sort of the bloke that just, I don't know, I was sort of, it sounds like I'm blowing my, my own trumpet here, but I was kind of Mr. Reliable, just get on with the job and get it done. Sure. Um, so when the call come in that, you know, I'm not well and yeah. I can't come to work, it, it Kind of shocked a few people, and mm. um, uh, and and I don't think I was the only one in that that sort of job that was fallen over like that because mm. um, you know in the the um, sort of months and years that followed when I was no longer doing child protection work, you know the they started introducing you know psychometric testing and and psych evaluations and yep. things like that and it, it goes on to this day so um uh so so how do you um from that point mm-hmm. how much time do you take off work and, and what do you actively have to do to try to get yourself better i guess you do you see the doctor yeah yep so doctor psychologist psychiatrist um time for me was the the biggest thing um i'm still learning stuff now and this is that was uh well 6th of december 2006 was the the morning i sat at the end of the bed crying um um there was a few false starts going back to work so i had i did have again it it was sort of a continuum i'd have i had quite a few months off work um they did what they call a um a graduated or a um return to work plan so you know a couple of days here so with your doctor and your psychologist and whatever they are they work out a plan through um with the organization you can come back a couple of hours this day and and to be honest in reflection now i found that a little bit um i won't say traumatic but but that was i don't think that helped so much because you you felt like you were that different like you know that you were you were seen as, you know, the bloke that can only work a couple of hours and he's got to go home, you know. And yeah. So you felt um, no longer useful or no longer uh, effective. Le- yeah, certainly, yeah, certainly I w- I'd change. And look, it, it did it did change me, um, no doubt. And, and I had to get off the road. That was the end of my 20 years on the road. I did try to get back in, not, you know, not in, uh, I couldn't go back into child protection investigation, Um it was one of the, well. It was probably the most worthwhile thing I've done in in the job um, over the years. But um, yeah, just didn't manage myself very well. Um, yeah. Well, to me, Cole, it's it's like it's the ultimate form of self sacrifice. You know, you're doing a job that not many people want to do, mm. and um, the benefits to the community are, mm. are, are, I guess, sort of unknown. But it's yeah. It's, yeah, and you could feel it coming and I guess, God, there'd be countless officers in your same position. You feel it come, coming, feel it coming, it happens. Mm. And then after that, do you do you eventually move to the academy? Was, was that your role after? That, well, yeah, it, it was, so 06, um, 07, I thought, well, if I can't be in uh, an investigative role, I'll go back to generals for a while. I. You know, over time I felt I felt better and I went back you know eventually full time and I was working back in general duties back at Redcliffe um, and I, it was pretty much 12 months to day I was again finding that different situations were causing me anxiety I was you know some triggers um, dealing with uh, 
conflict and it's a job where that's what you deal with you know you're dealing with conflict and you're starting to get anxious about it um and you're responsible again you know there was times where i was responsible for a team or responsible for one of the first year constables that have just graduated and you've got to look after them um you'd go to jobs that i used to get called in for um in terms of a, a child death and i knew i wasn't good for me to go and be like there would be a crew there doing the job um, and I'd want to go and help them and make sure they were okay but I just knew I couldn't do it and I got was extremely guilty about that um, and um, yeah it, after about 12 months of that I just knew I was heading for another fall I could just feel it building up again so sure. again had to take some more a bit of a setback took some more time off work mm. um and um i think and again this is where that memory it gets a bit faded the the order things happen in but um i remember at one stage thinking i don't think i can be a copper anymore you know i just mm-hmm. don't know if i can and, and i had time off um and it was as late as christmas so we're talking from september through to christmas time uh, so that's quite a few months i was off on sick leave um and we'd gone away for christmas and i just sort of remember um sort of over that holiday that we were having away from home thinking i'm actually feeling a lot better i feel like i can you know i can do something and you know i feel like i probably can go back so i i end up getting into uh, an area where it was training on a local level what they call the education and training off so every every larger station you know um, will have an um, one or a few education and training officers whose job is to you know pretty much monitor and and track the training of the first year constable so after you get out of the academy if for 12 months you're on probation and you've got certain um hoops you got to jump through so they monitor their progress and make sure that they're they're ticking the boxes and that they're Mm. they're becoming an autonomous police officer so they do that they organize you know all of the training needs for the the area for the you know over the that period so i got some did did some work in there and and did quite well there um and um there was a job on offer at the police academy and i had in the back of my mind for years thought well it'd be nice to after you've done a little bit to go and sort of give back and and mm. maybe contribute to the training of the next generation and stuff so Carl, what's your advice to other officers out there who are hearing this um if they can feel something coming on mm-hmm. it hasn't happened yet but they can feel it coming on yeah what what should they do do you have to wait to actually have the have the answer are you better off once you can feel it coming on to acting at that point yeah look talk talking to someone about it you know um talk to your family about stuff tell them how you're feeling and i'm still not i'm i don't know what marie thinks over there but there are times i'm better at talking about how i'm feeling about things than i was you know i i was always um tried to be a glass half full sort of a bloke and um you know you can fake it until you make it so i I say i'm feeling good so i'm feeling good and um and that's you know that's a good outlook to have in general but sure but you need to be able to talk about stuff that isn't going so well too so so do you go to the boss and say i can feel something coming on well what does the boss do um what does do they put you on different duties or they just keep a close eye on you. What's the process? Yeah, you the- don't even have to go to the boss. Like I say, you can jump on, you know, as a police officer, you can jump online on, on our, what they call our intranet, and there's an online um, questionnaire that you can do in there. I did it just the other day because I was feeling, you know, down about some stuff and um, and, and have been for a while. And um, and I knew I had been, and, and I, like I said, I've, I've availed myself of some chats with psychiatrists and i'm and i'm gonna do it again because of um you know it's an ongoing management thing now for me you know and and i'm you know when I say i'm okay with that I'm, I'm okay with the process now so i i use it it's there for me to use sure. so you don't have to 
um, put it up on a notice board. You don't have to talk to the boss. If you feel comfortable talking to the boss, then for sure. If it's if you feel comfortable talking with a work colleague, you know, we um, after a while you have situations that, you know, you're working with some people a lot and, you know, you have work wives or work husbands, you know, they're the people that, you know, it's a big organisation, you work with a lot of people sure. and you get very, you know, closer to some than others. Um, yep. And, um, but, or talk to your family. It, it's really just talk to someone. Yep. You know? So, Cole, do you think, well, you know, once you come out the other side of this, do you think yep. you can actually end up in a stronger position? Um, or do you think, is it is it always kind of lingering, even, even after you, you feel a bit better? I guess it's just sort of this... A, a bit of a shadow over you or do you, or do you think that um, you can really just uh, check in with yourself? I guess I guess everyone has different periods in their life mm. where they they go through stuff and they um, have to do some self-reflection and um, maybe change their lifestyle or maybe start running, for example, yeah. or maybe do some meditation or maybe, you know, Maybe just take a day off and, and slow things down. So do all those things. Do all those things. Come to the country. Yeah, come out to Dead Cow Gully. Right, fantastic. That, you know, this is that's all part. Mm. You, you, I don't know if I can answer you. I can only answer your question for me. Everyone's going to be different. When I that sixth of December two thousand and six, uh, the way I had always seemed to me was it was like letting a genie out of a bottle but not a good way and you can never get it back in gotcha you know the the emotions come out the ones that you've been hanging on to and keeping a lid on um they come out and you just can't get them back in you know they're they're out there um and you're not the same inside anymore but i remember the the psychologist i was talking to and he was um i, I didn't understand what he was trying to get me to do at times i do now um cognitive therapy i understand what it was all about well i understand better what it was about i didn't i did all the stuff i needed to do i i you know i, I knew there was a process i had to go through so i went through it um i didn't really understand um if it was helping me or how it was helping me um but um you know years down the track now what are we talking, 15 or more years? Um, you know, I've got a better understanding of what he's talking about, about, mm. you know, that the cognitive processes. Um, so um, do you get better? You get smarter or you learn or, well, you can learn, you know. It's, I, guess you, I guess you adapt. Of course you Yeah. So, yeah. and again, when you ask that question, I was thinking that we were just listening to a podcast on the way up here and it was um, – um, what's his name? Pato from Backyard. Yeah, great um, podcast. Yeah. That, yeah, well, I've, I heard a guy, Tim Walsh, talking on it the other day. Yeah, oh, yeah right. Number one. Um, so, um, but yeah, talking to, and I've heard a couple of things with Ryan Crawford talking, and, and he talks about um, the, you know, the, the, the failures or when things don't go well for you they're learning you get smarter for it's it's you know it's it's currency in the bank for next time you know he mm. he recognizes what he what he did wrong in the um you know the satellite world championships and it's in the bank for next time you know mm -hmm. um there's no substitute for experience i think we were talking about it before you know it's one thing to listen to podcasts and hear guys talk about you know this and other but until you go and experience it yourself you don't always appreciate um so i'm not saying go out and experience ptsd <laughs> but what i'm saying is all the stuff that you know the the qps talked if you're a police officer listening to this all the stuff they talk to you about about you know the um the online support your you know what we used to call um, HSOs, human services officers, now called senior psychologists. All of those resources are there for you to use. Use them. Talk to people. You know, just do it. It's not, it's not weak. It's smart. Our Dead Cow Gully documentary has amassed one hundred thousand views. That is absolutely crazy. 
But look, it's not surprising in a sense because it's a beautiful doco which captures the spirit of a gully and inspires people to go out for a run and push their limits. While we love putting out that content, it does cost us some money. We think it's worth the expense, but you can actually help us out. All you have to do is subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's just one click and it's free. So there is no cost. If we can get more subscribers to our channel, we can monetize and get paid through YouTube advertisements. This will help us pay for future podcasts and documentaries. So please hit that subscribe button. Thank you so much. I just before we move on, I, I like to talk about your running as well because right. you've they've done some incredible things. <laughs> how, as a police officer, how how do you not get negative and pessimistic about society in general? Because you're dealing with dealing with a lot of things that the general public just wouldn't be exposed to. You th- we kind of know it exists, but you're actually dealing with it directly. Mm. How do you come home and have dinner with your family, and how can you still be positive and chipper, have a positive outlook Hmm. without being kind of like jaded, Mm. cynical and sort of a little bit depressed at at how how the world's kind of ended up or um, because, yeah, I I take it depends where you're stationed, but I'd imagine it'd be pretty easy to get cynical very quickly. Yeah. The flippant answer to that is um, get off the road and go into training recruits where you've got to talk up everything. Um, but to be fair, like the, the job I'm doing now, um, I said the child protection work was the most um, worthwhile job I've done. Um, the job I'm doing now teaching recruits is, um, you know, it's a great job, it really is. Um, so... But not everyone can do that. Uh, not everyone wants to do it. Um, and it's it's a pay cut. If you're out in a road doing shift work, you're getting paid, you know, 20%, 21% more than you get if you're not working shift work. And that's, mm. you know, money money's necessary. Um, hard not to, really hard not to. I've been guilty of all those things that you spoke about. Um, we have our own particular sort of humour. Um, sometimes that goes too far. Um Sometimes it, you know, makes the the Courier Mail or you know Channel Nine News or whatever. Um, but that that's a way of, of coping with, with the stress of the job, right? Yeah. I'd, probably, I'd imagine it'd be dark dark humour. Yeah, there's a time and place for that. Look, there was just yeah, yesterday at work or the other, there was a, um, and this is a case of where it's probably just gone a little bit too far. Um, we have we put out uh, you know, when I say we the, the real police the operational police put out um, what we call an intel intelligence bulletin out to you know via the email to whoever you know the station group or the district or, or statewide whatever um, some CCTV photos a bit of a this person was seen doing such and such um, need help to um, uh, identify you know this person whatever okay so. Um, one came out from a, a station yesterday, the day before, where somehow the officer, with a bit of a sense of humour, slipped one through about um, the, something about a, a family um, taking their children out to teach them about uh, committing crimes and stuff. And I think your uh, daughter's just turned up oh, outside. Kate, Kate, yeah, Kate's <laughs> here, though. Yeah. Um, uh, and put a bit of a quite a funny narrative to it, you know, about how they were unsuccessfully trying to, you know, kick a door open and then um, some term the effect of um, uh, when the theme music from Benny Hill stopped playing in my mind, I then saw them do this, this and this and, you know, and this got sent out to, a, you know, a station or a district or whatever. So we were having a – some of us were having a bit of a laugh about it and others were going, oh, this is so unprofessional and blah. And <laughs> – you know, to be fair, yes, yes, it's unprofessional because it went out on you know the official channels, um, but that's the sort of thing that you might um, you know put together and send to a couple of your mates to say, "Hey, look at this funny sure. thing I just did," you know, and um, making a, a bit of uh, light-hearted humour out of you know people doing bad stuff, you know. Um, 
Mate, do you think, obviously, yeah, you're letting off steam there. Yeah. Do you think Australians are generally just anti-authority? Like, do you think there's an anti-authority streak? <sighs> there, look, there's an anti-authority streak with police at times, you know. It, it, it astounds me at times when, um, you know, sometimes I'm astounded by the hypocrisy of some of my colleagues when, and this is not, it stands out because for me, where um, supposedly the, I, don't know, I won't say the gatekeepers, that sounds a little bit dramatic, but you know, we're the ones that are supposed to be out enforcing laws and blah, blah, blah. But then when, you know, the government or the organisation say, no, we need you to do this and this and this and this, you know, the, the amount of um, gnashing of teeth and, oh, what are they, you know, they're trying to control us and blah, blah, blah. I'm thinking, guys, come on, you know, like they're holding us to a higher standard because that's the nature of the job, you know, where we've, we're allowed to do things or we've got the authority to do things that most people can't do in, you know, certain circumstances. So there should be checks and balances, you know. It's like politicians. There should be, you know, I personally think that politicians should be held to a much higher standard than they are. I think police sure. should be held to a sure. standard, you know. That might be unpopular with some of my colleagues, but absolutely we should be, you know. Yeah, so I guess what do you think some people's interactions with police are negative in, in the sense that, um, you know, it could be a speeding ticket. It's mm-hmm. like, oh, it's, it's, it's a pain or it could be yep. a random breath test or it mm. could be, um, I guess if you're doing the right thing, you've got, yep. you've got nothing to worry about. But yep. I remember when I was in, in Toowoomba when I was a younger fella, in my early 20s and I uh, went to Subway and I was I was walking home and there was this sort of this gang of kids there would have been do set, I do set. I need to warn you about your right to silence before you say well, something <laughs> maybe mate maybe but I I hadn't I was just a small town fella I yeah. was in Toowoomba and this gang this this kid these kids seven or eight kids they're kind of asking for money and I said oh look I don't have anything mm. As I was crossing the street, they were following me, and they kept asking and asking for money. And and um, yeah, I felt a bit uncomfortable. And they they just kept on following me and hanging around, and they became a little bit more aggressive. Mm. And I ended up just bolting. So I just sort of just full sprint. Mm-hmm. Um, I was only about probably three or four hundred meters from from the place where I was living. They they. At least two of them followed me. They kept up with me. Hmm. And the adrenaline kicked in and I just went for it. And, um, yeah, I finally got back to the unit and got my keys out of my wallet and I'm just trying to get in the door and hmm. um, I didn't know how far they were behind me at that point. And as I got in, I, I, I locked the door and then I heard some rocks hit the roof and I'm like, oh, God, they, they know where I live. So, you know, I, I called the police and they were there within, it seemed they were there within two or three minutes. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they were exactly the people I wanted to see. They were like, I just a big sigh of relief. Yeah. They were sort of, you know, you know, literally knights in shining armour. Um, so when you need the police, uh, it's, yeah, it sort of seems you can't have it both ways. You, you've got to accept the speeding ticket. And this and that, but yeah. but when you need the police um, in situations like that, I can only imagine if it was something more serious. Mm. But um, yeah, I, I, I was forever thankful that those yeah. those people showed up. Yeah, look, I, I I take your point. Sometimes the only contact, oh, sorry, the only contact that most people ever have, if they have any contact with police, is if they, and well, even less and less these days, getting a. a a, a ticket for something because there's so much more camera generated stuff but um or yeah like you say a, a breath test um fortunately most people don't become victims of crime you know um but um but yeah you know th- there's people who are regularly getting or have got a lot of tickets from police over the over the years well there's probably a reason for that. It's not because these police have, you know, picked them out at random and gone looking for them. They've 
they've drawn tension to themselves, you know, they've, they've been somewhere they shouldn't have been or, or whatever. So, yeah, there's an, always an element of people who, um, you know, resent authority or the police and that sort of stuff. And, yeah, look, we're, we're you know, we've got a, a bit of a, a convict culture about us in Australia and that's, you know, I, I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, and I can, like with, certainly with Indigenous Australians, there's a whole lot of history there that would cause them to be um, culturally um, and generationally concerned about police. Um, fortunately, we're trying to do things to, to make that better. Mm. But by and large, um, and particularly now that I'm not dealing with, you know, that 5% of... I've always known, you know, intellectually or whatever, that, you know, it's the 5% of our community that, that make up 95% of our work as police. And yeah, you know? you're dealing with um, the 5%. And you've yeah, and that's when you're dealing with that 5% all, all the time, you know, that's that becomes your reality. But, but yeah, you know, so emotionally that's what you're thinking. But intellectually, I know, and I'm, I think most coppers know, that's, you know, the statistics. We're not dealing with mm. the mainstream, but... Um, if, if that gets reinforced as your experience time and time again, then you tend to forget that you know we're doing it for the other ninety five percent. I guess you, I guess you wouldn't get a, a lot of positive feedback too. Like, I, I, I doubt many times you'd have people coming up on the street saying, "Like, I, I really appreciate what you're doing. Thank, thanks for your service. Mm. Thanks for protecting the community." Yeah. I guess you wouldn't really hear that a lot. Um, but I get, I think more people should should say it because. Um, yeah, you are dealing with the five percent. Hmm. I, I think it's a po- that's one positive about social media. I'm not a uh, a huge fan of social media. I think most of it's there's a whole lot of time wasting factor built in there. But um, it's like any tool, you know. Uh, it it can be a really handy tool, or it can be completely destructive. Um, but we. I think there's a lot more avenues where people can and, and do express their appreciation for police. Um, and I, I, I make a point of that with, um, you know, when I'm talking to my recruits at, at a particular time, you know, again, back when the, the most tragic things happened, so again, back to, you know, the Tara shootings last year, um, the outpouring of support from the community, I, I made a point of saying, guys, this is a terrible thing that's happened, but just remember what you're seeing out there, um, not just in um, Tar and Chinchilla, but at every police station and all those sorts of things, because those are the people you're working for, you know. Um, so there's, you know, I think we do a good job. Sure, we're, we get criticised for a lot of things, and that's the nature of the work we do. Um, Sometimes it's justified, sometimes it isn't. Um, but, you know, I always... Um, I, I think there is a lot of... There's a thing called police legitimacy. Um, we we can't operate effectively within the community unless the community recognises that we are a legitimate um, part of, you know, the structure of society. If, if we don't have the confidence of the community... You know, we don't get all those, the information we need, the phone calls. We don't, you know, people trust that if they go to the police with some information that they can, you know, something can be done about it. Um, you know, I'm not saying it, it always, we always get it right, but, um, you know, the, um, by and large, I think we've, we've, we do that a lot better now than we, we have over the, you know, again, going back to when I first started, you know, the, mm. the Fitzgerald inquiry was devastating for our reputation and you know there were some huge problems that needed to be dealt with um and you know the the problems that came out now that were evident then you know i I won't say that there's no corruption but there's certainly no um systemic or embedded corruption in the organization um there's always you know there's in any big organisation, there's people who make mistakes, do the wrong thing, let the rest of the organisation down. But, you know, there's no, you know, 
protection rackets and things going sure. on and brown paper bags and all that sort of stuff. Sure. Well, Kyle, look, we'll talk about your running because um, sure. I think we've done <laughs> spent a bit of time in the police force. Oh, we all right, we mate. talk all day because I'm, I'm just fascinated, mate. Like, That's um, all right. it's I don't mind. It's a bit of a mystery to me. Um, so yeah, th- thanks for sharing all that. So, how did you get into running? I think we've had conversations before, and you did sort of triathlon type stuff. Um, and you, you, it seems like you've always been a fairly fit guy in terms of cycling or yeah. just your general fitness. But now. Do you mind just talking about your fitness journey and then your sure. big, your big uh, run recently? Uh huh. Yeah. Okay, if you can well, talk about that. It's, it's all. Um, yeah. Well, look. Predominantly, I've always seen myself as a cyclist. I um, got into cycling in high school. Um, a few mates were doing it, and it sounded interesting to me, and and um, got into that. I still. You know, I mean, I, I played sport at school. I, you know, I'd be one of the one of the the kids getting in at to school at you know like six thirty or seven just so you can get the cricket nets first or get up you know in in uh, summertime or or playing uh, not that I was a big soccer f- fan but if if our mob was playing soccer or or touch footy or whatever you know you get in early so you can get some games in before before school started so uh, always did that did a bit of. You know, as far as running goes at school, more of a sprinter than anything. Hurdles was kind of what I got into. Didn't, you know, make, I mean, I went to some regional stuff, but, you know, was certainly not committed to it in so, so far as, you know, training for anything, just turn up and run, you know. Um, but, yeah, got as far as the sport goes, I, I really sort of got into cycling um, through high school and then post high school. Um when you say when you say you got into cycling, were you doing actual competitive events? Yeah, road road racing, road and, racing? and some and some track racing on the velodrome. Yeah, yeah. what yeah, sort of so distances were you doing for the road races? Um, well, at the at the young ages, like in what well, they back then it was called they call it juniors now, but um, back in those days it'd be restricted. So I don't think we would have gone more than maybe as far as races go, probably forty k. Okay, so. but as yeah. you get it up. Into the more open races, you know, you could be doing, you know, 60, 80, 160K races at times. Wow. All amateur stuff back then, you know. The, the, um, the, there was a, a very uh, a strong distinction between amateur and professional cycling back then. Um, uh, it's more of a continuum these days. I mean, sorry, there, there is a very, a very large, um, amateur cycling cohort these days is a very popular sport um but um yeah the progression from those sort of junior ranks into you know professional semi-professional teams is much more the the pathways is much more established these days and not you know like you know had childish dreams of you know riding in the tour de france and that sort of stuff but you know, realistically, I was just out having a, having a bit of fun and racing with my mates and things. It was a pretty rare thing to do back in the, those days. We're talking back in the eighties, um, so it wasn't an overly popular sport compared to you know your, your traditional rugby leagues and crickets and that sort of stuff. So I was a bit of um, a bit of an outlier as far as that went. Um, probably one of the uh, it's not not particularly rare these days, but probably one of the first kids to shave my legs at high school oh, right. yeah yeah it was that was that was right. definitely unusual back in the day but uh um but anyway that by the boy um anyway so after s- finished the high school worked for a bit got into the police uh, as i said at, at 19 um and the the cycling sort of had to go on the back burner i'd you know, started doing a bit of running to get fit for the academy and that sort of stuff. So I've always ran and, and you know, as I got older, learnt a bit more about endurance type running rather than sprinting and things. Um, made a few comebacks to cycling for a little while, but it's just hard to maintain. Um, I, I did incorporate cycling into, insofar as I would, um, you know, maybe ride my bike to work. So at different times I'd, I'd we lived, depending on where I was stationed, you know, we might have been anywhere from 15 to like 30 k's, 
from home to work. So I'd organise, you know, get all my uniforms into work and, you know, ride in one morning and have a shower at work and get changed and ride home and that sort of stuff. So I did, you know, kind of keep a, a level of fitness. I was never um, blown out as far as, you know, weight and condition, that sort mm. of stuff. Um, but uh, as far as and, – and did get back into cycling in later years in, you know, probably as part of my – you just, know. you just got a few friends out there, mate. Sorry. You got a few friends oh, out yeah. there. Come out to check them. They're, they're, they're interested. Out. They're interested in your story yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're leaning in, mate. They're leaning in. Um, just, just for the listeners, we got a we got a few um, few calves out there. Well, wieners. Wieners. Yeah. 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 Sorry, um, Carl. No, that's all right. I got, I got into a bit of uh, what they called um, masters. Is it masters cycling? What were we called? Mm. Veteran um, masters. Yeah, cycling probably post sort of a. PTSD stuff, um, started riding again and got back into racing for a good few years and did a couple of um, bigger races, not to any great effect, but, you know, was got fit again. And um, as far as the running went, really um, probably have to credit Marie with that, really, because um, she uh, – well, I won't – it's her story to tell, but – she started, um, you know, getting into some fitness and training. And look, she's, I've been, for the most part, you know, I've been out and working and um, doing the shift work and that sort of stuff. And, and certainly she always put uh, me and the kids ahead of her own health and, and things. And, um, you know, she played a little bit of sport in younger days, netball and that kind of stuff. But, um Probably, you know, I don't know how to put this, probably didn't have a, a real deep uh, athletic pedigree, you know, as far as that sort of stuff. But in, in the last probably, or just probably pre-COVID, she started getting, you know, doing, getting with some, some friends we had who were PTs and stuff and getting fit and... Uh, losing some weight. Oh, it's probably her. Actually, probably her journey started just over ten years ago when she gave up smoking um, in 2012, and that was a, a very you know, courageous and, and a hard thing to do because. Um, uh, but anyway, so yeah, so she started getting fitter and um, and uh, exercising, and I think I mentioned to you before about she'd. Um, at one stage, we went away in our caravan out to sort of western Queensland and she um, liked it so much there, she decided to stay on and work out there at, at Lara, out near Bark Alden and Beautiful. stayed there. And, and we'd already, you know, we carried some little, uh, you know, what they call kettlebell weights and things in the car with us. So, you know, she was doing bits and pieces. But, um, yeah, she'd get out and she'd run. It was about 12 k's up to the – from the – the the camping ground out to the main highway so uh be nice never, and nice and flat yeah sandy pretty flat uh kind of tracks out there yeah but um we didn't go all the way there but we'd sort of run you know maybe just out past one of the you know the first grid and back and it'd be about a 12k or a 14k run at times and and she kept that up while she was sort of working there in the mornings and it was beautiful sort of cool winter weather too so um and um yeah and then um she kind of well she kind of she she got more and more involved with the, the run with rob crew um mm. our history with rob uh he was actually our neighbor for a while we'd we'd um almost finished building our house there at warner where where you and and zach stayed uh late last year and um, Rob had just moved down, his family had just moved down from, uh, I think, Bagara, and they rented the house next door to us. So we got to meet Rob and, you know, I knew from talking to him that he got into a bit of running and that sort of stuff. Um, didn't really know. I don't know, even know if the Run With Rob movement existed at the time. That was that would have been 2018, um, 2019. So 20, 2018. So yeah. just for those listening, yeah. Run with Rob is a, a running club primarily in Brisbane, but you've got different locations. What popping up in Harvey Bay, Sunshine yeah, Coast. Yeah. Well, he originally started. I think 
Bagara and Harvey Bay and, and that sort of stuff is kind of where he started with it. Um, so it's just okay. a community running club, yeah, right? Yeah, look, you know, some say club, I say cult. But, um, <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it is – at the moment it's kind of a very informal um, club. It, it's not your traditional um, incorporated type – you know sporting club or anything like that but um due to the growth in it i think that's going to have to come but it's really a a group of um i guess like-minded people with a similar philosophy about life and and running and and the benefits of um you know fitness community health um and you know running is the, the key component but really it's the whole um I guess of the group is well two, twofold to, to get people participating and, and you know, living healthy lifestyles both through running and but also um, raising fund for, funds for charity so it's yeah so I, I sort of I see them on social media and um, yeah a lot of them are coming out to dead cow in, mm. in April yeah. which is fantastic so I've had had some chats with Rob but you know, they're, they're getting up at, um, what, 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning yeah. to go for runs. This yeah. is during the week. Yeah. So they, they do this before their work day starts. So yeah. I guess it's so much easier meeting a group at 4.30 than running by yourself at 4.30, surely. Sure. Well, yeah, that's um, – so I, I guess maybe just go back to the story a little bit. But um, so, you know, the, as far as the, the running – we already knew Rob, um, Marie, and we, you know, we kept in touch with Rob and, and um, Rochelle and, and the kids and that sort of stuff because like, when they moved into their own place, it wasn't that far from where we live. But um, and Marie, I'm not, I can't, don't know, I can't remember the, the exact, you know, the, the, the machinations there. But Marie decided that um, she'd go and join the running group that meet at Eden Hill, as you say, at quarter to five every morning and um, go for a, a run. Um, and there, there are some that get up earlier and do a longer run beforehand and, and, and the, Rob and some of the others, um, depending on their, their program. But um, And, yeah, she got involved in that and um, really I sort of decided I, I don't – I suppose the other part of our running journey is that where we moved to at Warner, there's a, a park run right there in the, the park that we sort of look over um so it was almost impossible not to get involved in park run and, and really enjoyed that and we you know when we when we get the chance to travel around the caravan we're always looking for a, a local park run to go to so that was probably the start of the the running journey back in you know i guess we jumped on board with that in about 2016 dropped off a bit during 2017 while we were building the house had a, a bit of other, other stuff on there and then um once we'd moved into the house in 2018, sort of got back into the park run. And, yeah, that morphed into um, Marie getting involved with uh, the Run With Rob group. And I, I sort of thought, well, this is Marie's journey. I'll, you know, she'd supported me for some, you know, cycling events and letting me get out training, that sort of stuff. So I was more than happy to, you know, jog along with her or, or support her however she needed to. But... Uh, slowly but surely, I got drawn into the cult, and mm. um, and really, you know, I, I used to say, and I still do say flippantly sometimes, that the best part about running is when you stop at the end. Um, yeah, it's it's. But, do you think it's like type two fun? So when you're mm. doing it, it you can be suffering, and there's a lot of yeah. discomfort, but it's it's. When you finish, or those few days after, where you look mm. back and you think, "Oh, yeah. that was that was amazing." I, it, it's not dissimilar to cycling or any exercise like that. You know, the old endorphin rush and, and afterglow. You know, that's that's uh, you know, it, it's it's free legal drugs. You know, so um, it's a good thing. Um, but yeah, so the running became a bigger part of our life, and you know, we've um, uh, got more and more involved with that. And oh, Kate, yes, right, a daughter Kate, she's right into it as well. Kate's just arrived, yeah. So um, we um, do a sort of run of the fa- – oh, well, our little family became part of the bigger running community. And like you say, we were up here last year crewing at Dead Cow Gully. Like I didn't even know what 
Marie was talking about this dead cow gully thing and <laughs> yeah, whatever, whatever that is. <laughs> Sounds um, a bit sus. Yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, so I, you know, um, my, my main role is to hook up the caravan and get that wherever it needs to be so that Marie's got the, the well, we've got the luxuries of life behind us. So, so that was my main role. But then you get drawn into the, the crewing and that sort of stuff. And I was on the peripheries of that sort of stuff, um, you know, running around and making sure that there was water where it needed to be or mm. whatever. And, and um, when all of our runners had finished um, – they were all pretty grateful to get in the caravan shower and have, sure. a, have a shower before they bunked down for the night. Yeah. So you've seen a Backyard Ultra yeah. as a crew member mm. and now you're going to um, – you've signed up for, for this Easter. Yes, yes. Do you think um, as a crew member last year, were you was it kind of ticking over in your head how to approach this format or how to approach Dead Cal Gully? Like have you got any um, – you want to share anything with people about how you're going to approach it in a couple of months? Uh with an open mind, really, um, I. So you've got about two, about about two months until. Yeah, yeah. Um, yep. So look, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely trained. To be honest, uh, again, this year, you know, Marie and and Kate, our daughter Kate, um, you know, they decided after coming up last year they were going to do it, and I was, I was just going to come up and crew, and even until recently, I was just going to crew because you know this really is. Um, I still think it's mostly about about them and and um, um, just me sort of maybe giving back a bit the way they've supported me over all the years. Um, but Marie's pretty, you know, when you sort of tell her, no, you're going to run and I'm going to crew, she just um, re- reframes it, you know, a couple of days later and say, so do you think you're going to run in Dead Cow Gully? And... Mm. You know, eventually what it means is you're going to run in Dead Cow Cully and um, so, yeah, mm. you know, just her obtuse way of getting to it. So anyway, there was um, uh, another one of our um, Run With Rob guys that, or crew that had um, had signed up but decided that she wasn't going to be ready for it. So I, I think I took over or somehow we swapped over to her ticket Um um, and yeah, once you're sort of committed to do it, you got to start getting st- thinking seriously about it. So, do you think older runners have have an advantage in terms of endurance because they've they've been through more things in life compared to someone in their early twenties? Like, you often see you often see older guys and girls win these events. Mm-hmm. Um, they seem to have a lot more grit, a lot mm-hmm. more mental toughness. Uh, you know, obviously the shorter distances, yeah. the the younger runners dominate, but the longer distances, yeah. it seems, it seems like it's, it's an older person's game. Yeah. Oh, look, I, you know, again, I, I'm still pretty new to the whole scene, and and um, well, I think with Josh Duff, he was wasn't he the um, yes, the assist the assist last year, yeah. so he's wasn't that. Older, but he's a pretty young fella still, isn't he? No, yeah, he's he's. I think he's in his um, I I think he's still in his thirties. Yeah, yeah. But he he comes from a triathlete, a triathlete, yeah, Ironman background. Yeah. So he he was the biggest surprise because um, yeah. we we sort of had a bit of a top a top five runners leading up to the event. Who do we think is going to do well? And yeah, um, Josh, he wasn't even a dark horse. So yeah. um, the people. Because I he, think it was his first. It was his first uh, backyard. First I think, ever too. backyard. Yeah, yeah. He, he surprised everyone, and now yeah. we're actually getting more uh, triathletes come across. Mm. So Holly, I think Holly Ranson. Yep. Um, she was down at historical carnage, mm. and um, yep, she's coming up to masters. Yeah. yeah. So and so yeah, I think um, that that surprised everyone. So I think there's a whole other class of athletes yeah. that could actually try yeah. their hand at, at backyards. Yeah. I wonder whether and look, I don't know because um, I've I've been doing a bit of study before I come up for this podcast today, mate. And listening to some other podcasts and listening to you talking to Pato, and uh, then just listening to some more of his. And, and Josh was one of them uh, about his you know, from when he when Pato first started. Was it just last year that he started with his podcast? Hello, yeah, I like yeah. to sort of go back to the start and start listening I, I was through. His, I was the first, first guest. One, yeah, I remember yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, he's doing really well. He he um, smashed out 
twenty six slopes at MVP. Yes, last yeah. weekend. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um. Cause he, yeah, because I think he was talking about wanting to get to thirty or something. But anyway, yeah. Um, but yeah, he interviewed Josh, and Josh had just run. Uh, was it the mongrel? The, the the old mate, the old mate, um, old mate, yeah. old mate up in Atherton or something. So he's the race director for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. So uh, he was interesting to listen to as well. But mm. um, a bit like you were saying when you were talking with Pato about the masters, it's uh, interesting idea to just start getting some, you know, people from other disciplines in to not just your dedicated backyard runners start getting some other ultras or some trail i think you were talking about you know, uh, ned um brockman ned or brockman, something yeah. or who's that young lady that just did her yeah i, got uh, I can't remember her name, name escapes you? me but yeah. a lot of these high profile people are really hard to contact yeah but they yeah. get they would get inundated by a lot of messages <clears> and yeah I, you know i just don't know who to talk to about yeah. ned but i'd really like a race walker to come out here. Yeah, I remember you heard you, remember you saying about that. I just that. Don't, yeah. I don't really have the contact. So if, if you know anyone, Cole, if anyone listening knows anyone, because <sighs> yeah. imagine if someone didn't run at all and they just walked the whole thing just yeah. really quickly. You would – well, yeah, and you'd need to – I think with Marie and I and Kate doing a bit of bit of training for, for this, you know, the, you need to kind of do – um, like an eight an eight minute K, you can get around pretty comfortably, but over that it's starting to get, and that, that's a fairly far a faster walk. You know, you wouldn't. Yeah, yeah so it's, I, it's more, more than a more than a quick stroll, really, isn't it? Yep. it it's a bit more, like you say, race walky. Yeah, I can walk pretty comfortably at six Ks an hour, yeah. pretty comfortably. Yeah, you can go quicker. Yeah. You know, six point two, six point three, but yep. yeah, I think. If you want to go through in 53, 54 minutes, yeah. you only really have to run. I think it was eight, eight something or something, yeah. You don't have to run that much. You know, yeah. you could run 2Ks or less and, and yeah. still make it back. Yeah. Yeah, as long as you're moving forward. If you if you stop, that's going to be an issue if you stop for five minutes. But as long as, yeah. you're, as, long as you're moving forward. Mm. Yeah, and and sure. actually walking, I know in other events, like a, a point-to-point, you consider it a failure if you if you walk. You know, um, obviously you can you're going to walk up hills, but walking's a real strategy out here. And mm. yeah, don't don't think that um, yeah when you're running when you're walking, I think it's they're both equally important. Yeah, and I'm I'm picking that up from listening to guys too. You know when. Um they had the four of the guys that, that did that that satellite worlds down at um, Mir- oh, was it Miram? Uh, Miram weren't it? Weren't it? it? Yeah. yeah. And they're all talking about you know just getting to know the course and where you're going to run, where you're going to walk, and that sort of stuff. And yeah, it's really a, it sounds like it's an important thing to to get your head around. But yeah, if you um, can work that out from the get go, yeah. Um, yeah, I know Rob Parsons at Miram Werner. Now he did, um, I think it was 73, 73 yards. And he. Um, he was the third, the the third, third last, wasn't he? Yeah. Third last. And he, yeah. he surprised everyone. So he yeah. he was back of the pack the whole event. He, mm. he came in, you know, 53, 54. He, he was really struggling mm. in the 20s. Around twenty five to thirty yards, people thought it looks like he's going to actually going to drop out. Yeah, but yeah, he um he just kept ticking it Good over, down. ticking it over, and he um he just had such a strong mental game. Yeah, and I learnt that yeah he's a he works out at Kalgoorlie in the mines out there, and rain, hail or shine, that bloke gets up and goes for a run like every morning. Yeah, and he's just got that discipline. I'm not sure how much rain or hail they get at Kalgoorlie, well, true. but anyway, it'll be mostly shine, I, would, I imagine. I've never been there. But. I'm trying to contact him. I, I was yeah. trying to get his number because I know he's doing a 100-mile race right now. Yeah. But, geez, if we can get him up here, because mm. um, we've already got Ryan and Phil yep. and Harvey, and he has a big, big list, mate. But um, mm. yeah, It's going to be interesting. Yeah, it's exciting, mate. Um. Yeah, we had a chat before the podcast about possibly a goal for you and you said maybe 
maybe eight, maybe ten, maybe twelve. Yeah, I um, oh look, I I, I kind of thought like I, I've done, you know, I've done six in in training, and it was yeah, you know, I'm saying it's not, it's not not easy at all, but it's it's certainly doable, and um, you know, I, I certainly had. Uh, the ability to get up and, and do more um, if I'd been inclined to. But um, the, um, you know, I thought, I sort of thought 10 and then I, I realised that 12 is, you know, a half, what well, is that, 80, 80 k's or 50 mile, you know. Um, I thought, well, that's, that's a nice number. Um, but, you know, it's easy to throw numbers around when you get out there and, you know, you get to six and you realise, you know, oh, this is hurting. Um, People quickly change their tune. Like yeah, they, they, they yeah. have these big goals, right? Yeah. And then um, it's all theoretical at the moment. It, yeah. It's that, that well, theoretical learning and I, I haven't got the practical experience yet. Yeah. Once you're in it, it's it's very funny how people quickly say, oh, look, look, I want to save myself for this particular event. Or, yeah. Um, yeah, going for broke is, is great in theory, but. I think those loops can be hellish. When you're in pain, they can be absolutely yeah, hellish. Yeah. And it depends how far you want to push it. And if you talk to Ryan Crawford and hmm. I mean even yourself, like if you're in pain, do you do you stop or do you like what have you got to prove? Do you Yeah. And it's pain the different sorts you know, of pain. So if it's pain like yeah, I've got aches and sore knees, but if it's I I'm injured, there's something tearing in there or there's something not right, there's something grating, you know, that's and I'm sure that you know, like you say, the the Ryans and the the Robs and that sort of stuff, they they push through that sort of stuff. But I, I don't know that I'm really prepared to injure myself. I, I, I'm just not that. Um, it's just not what I'm what I'm looking to get out of this. You know, um, I um, you know, I know Marie loves and we love um, Nicole Dukes and. You know, she's amazing, that sort of stuff, and, and she absolutely is. But but I always recognise it with these these people that are um, that are the amazing athletes are the ones who are prepared to actually do to hurt themselves to do the stuff to get that. They're not just that way because that's how they are. They're that way because they're prepared to do the stuff they need to do to get there. And I'm not. That's not what I'm looking for. You know, I'm no. I'm, I'm not looking to be injured for you know i've got a, a few races i want to do i want to do a, a proper you know i've run marathon distance but i haven't done a marathon event yet so i want to do one this year you know um in i've got one in june the the, the wandai country festival oh, gonna, that's a great run do it yeah, out yeah. there so you yeah. know while i'd like to push myself at dead cow if it means i'm going to be injured and i've got to stop training for other stuff that's not really what i'm after you know so um, I'll you know I'll try and I, I was saying before running with um, you know Kate Kate's running really well and my daughter Kate and so we'll be running together and I think if you know if she gets up to do another loop then Dad'll probably have to get up to do another loop and mm. by the same token if Dad gets up then she'll probably be, she'll probably be uh, inclined to get up and do another one but it just depends on how you're traveling you know so I don't know really what to expect except that it'll be hard. Mm. Um, um, and you know, if you said what advice would I give or something was your question, you know, practice the format, you know, try which you have done. Yeah, we've been right. doing a little bit of that stuff, you know, and um, and I don't, I don't know. Again, I, I speak with no experience at all. I don't know that it's important that you go out and see. Well, how many can I actually do? You know, you don't have to go out and try and do ten or twelve or whatever. But maybe if you try to do two or three or you know, whatever if you if you can't get one yet we'll try and get one in within the hour you know and see how you feel and and even if you don't um sit down for a few minutes and get up and try and do it again just so you can push yourself a bit but maybe on a saturday try and do two or three and then get up on sunday and try and do another two or three you know and just see how it, how you're feeling after it you know um, mm. or, or whatever whatever level you're at so um but you know don't compare what you're doing with anyone else. Yeah, that's the biggest trap. It's not a race yeah. with anyone. That, you know, I, I, people talk about oh, I'm going in a race. I don't go in running races. I go in events. Because yeah. the only person I'm racing with is myself. 
That's right. Um, other people are racing with other people because they they're much better, and that's their thing. But I'm not trying to beat anyone. I'm just trying to beat what I've done before. Really, that's mm. my philosophy. Mm. And I'm good advice, that. mate. Good advice. Oh well, it, it works for me. It's not for everyone, but mm. that's, that's my philosophy, I suppose. And now, Cole, yeah. would you believe we've hit two hours? We're just over two hours, yeah, and. Yeah. Um, I was going to put you to work up in the up in the gully. Yeah, no, I know. I'm conscious of that, mate. And I, I've brought my headlamp, so it, that should yeah, be. Yeah. I can work into the night. I was going to show you the uh, lantana and stuff yeah, up there, and you yeah. we might attack it tomorrow. So yeah. uh, we might finish up here. But sure, um, thanks for coming in. I appreciate it. My pleasure, mate. Thank you for asking me.